So this morning, um, you don't have to stand. Um, I have a few scriptures to read. Um, I told the, I usually have like 30-something scriptures, so I toned it down today, so the media team is really excited about that. But I feel like I have a very prophetic word today. I know normally I come joking and, and having fun, and we will, but really in seeking the Lord about this service, immediately when Pastor Josh asked me to preach a few months back, the Lord immediately told me what to preach. And he told me, like John the Baptist, a spirit of John the Baptist, preparing people. John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord. There in the spirit, God is wanting his people to be prepared to meet the king of kings. He's wanting his people's hearts to get ready because Jesus is coming back for his bride. And if we're not ready, the Bible says he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And I don't want those words ever spoken to me. I want, me to, I want myself to be positioned in a way that every day I am walking with Jesus. I'm talking with Jesus. He's speaking to me. And it's not about me each day. It's God, I commit this day to you and I want your perfect will to be done. This day is not about me. It's about me showing the love of of God to people who have never felt it before. That whether I'm in the grocery store or at the gym or doing homework with my children, the love of God is flowing through me to that person. And they are dry and they're empty, but the rivers of living water are flowing through me to them. And they're saying, I want what you have. I want, I'm thirsty. I want this. But it can only flow through me first to them if I'm getting in that alone time with God and I'm talking to him and I'm reading this word and I'm praying. So today in the spirit of John the Baptist, I ask that you open your hearts and your mind because the spirit of the Lord is saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So today we're going to go to Luke 5, 4, and 11. And you can say seated because we have a, a little bit to read. We see here where Jesus is making his first C group. So I humbly get the opportunity to be a part of C groups here at House of Prayer. And we all want to be like Jesus, right? And so Jesus was in a C group, a little news flash. He had tw 12 guys that he hung out with, he did life with, he broke bread with. He talked about the things of God, of heaven. They broke bread together, right? So Jesus was in a C group. So here's a hint. You need to be in a C group. And so the awesome thing is miracles, signs, and wonders took place in their C group, right? And they won like thousands of people to the Lord. And so then the best part is once he's done, they didn't stay in the same C group. He said, hey, now it's time to you be a C group leader and you go out and you make disciples, right? So those of you staying in that same C group every single semester, that wasn't his plan, all right? So I'm sorry, I'm going to put a little commercial in there for that. So Jesus is in a C group and he starts out and he's going to look for his first people to join the C group. And so it says in Luke 5, 4 and 11, it says, When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and, they, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they be began to sink, to help them. And they began to fill both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Now the second time around, this next scripture we're going to read, Jesus had went to Calvary, he died on the cross, and he had rose. And so we find where in this, what we're about to read, a very unique story, but yet very, very similar. John 21, 3 and 11, 
Jesus goes to the same exact sea, the same exact place where he first found Peter. Only this time it's a little different. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. That night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw in it because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. For the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw fires of coal there, and a fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. So in both scriptures, we see where Peter and the other fishermen all night were fishing and caught nothing. And on this sea of life, it's pretty common that for most of us, where Jesus found us is at that place where we had finally come to the end of ourself, the end of our rope. We had tried everything and here Jesus found us empty so he could pour himself in. And so God has a way of coming to us when we're in that situation. And Jesus finds men that were very, very passionate, but their passion was just misplaced. These men were willing to work all night while the rest of the world slept. And they were driven by a pursuit of something they couldn't even see. But they knew with every fiber in them, if they could just reach it, that, and, they, and if they would just throw out in faith what they had, that they would have this provision. There was hope there. And so these men, just in faith, believed if at night they would work all night and cast out what they had, they would get something. And so they were very passionate. And so Jesus finds these very passionate men where their passion was just misplaced. And so Jesus walks on the scene, and I find it interesting because Jesus asked them, hey, you have anything? And so for many of us, we kind of need to ask that same thing. We've been toiling all night, we've been working, we've been working, doing our own thing, very passionate, a passion that God put in us, and we're doing our own thing and we're working so hard, but yet our nets are empty, and we have nothing to show for it, and we're frustrated, and we're aggravated. And so Jesus calls out, and he says, hey, how's it working for you, basically? How's it working doing your own thing? I see you've been going and going. Oh, not good? No fish? You tired? Your net nets are empty? And so here's a modern day example of this. Hey, how's it going for you? How's that job going for you that you never prayed about but you just took because you would make a lot of money? How's that marriage going for you that you never even prayed about if you should truly marry that person? And you never saw the Lord about if that's the person for you. Hey, how's that family going for you? That you don't pray as a family and you don't read the word together and you listen to music that's not even godly. And how's your family home life going? Hey, how's that child going? That you don't lay hands and pray over at night when they go to bed. Hey, how's that child going that you don't teach them the ways of God? How's their life going for you? that you haven't even been seeking and asking God, hey, would you guide me? 
What's your plan? What do you want for my life? I don't know how to raise this child, God. I wasn't raised in a Christian home, but every day, God, would you teach me and show me and put the words in my mouth? God, I have a passion inside of me to do, do this or that, but God, I know I'm in this job, but God, what job would you have me to do? that you could flow through me. Maybe, God, it's a job that you want me to position because the person next to me is suicidal and I could actually teach them and, and show them the love of God and bring them to church and teach them the word. God, what? who do you want me to marry? I'm lonely. I have no one. But, God, I believe, God, that you want me to be equally yoked, like your word says, with a believer, and together we can be one and do great things for you. And so... He asked them this question, and in both scriptures, he gives a command. He says, cast your nets again. In both scriptures, they obey, and in both scriptures, a miracle happens. You see, it didn't make sense, and a lot of times, God will tell you to do something that does not make sense. They had already tried that. I already tried the God thing. I already tried praying. I already tried this or that. And God says to do something. But what if your miracle is one act of obedience away? What if your miracle is one act of obedience away? One prayer away? One fast away? One tithe away? One worship song away? One altar call away? And your miracle's right there, and you stop one act of obedience away from your miracle. There were so many fish, they could not barely draw the multitude in. And in both situations, this is both a promise of their calling and of the provision that would come if they answered the call of God on their lives. Here's the problem with many of us. The promises of God can only be found in a sea of obedience. You want to be blessed. God, bless me. God, my finances. I need blessings with my finances. Guess what the Bible says? If you tithe, he will pour out a blessing so much on you, you can't even contain it, and your storehouses will overflow. But because you're not obedient to the word and you don't tithe, yet you're praying for financial blessing, that's not how God works. And the enemy is attacking you and your home, and the enemy is constantly attacking you, and you're praying, God, protect me from the enemy. But guess what the Bible says? If you tithe, he will rebuke the devourer. So you want God to do all this stuff, but you're not being obedient to the word, and so he can't keep his promises. So what if we just became obedient to the word? Then we get the promises. Then we get the miracles. And so these men were working in their own strength, in their own power, doing what they thought was a good plan. How many of you have been there? I know before God, I had all these great plans. And I was going to do this and this, and I was getting married here, and then have this job and all these things. And so in their own flesh, maybe their dads weren't fishermen. Maybe this is all they knew. This is their culture. You know, I was born into a fisherman family, and we're going to be fishermen, and maybe I'm not smart enough to be anything else, and this is just all I know, and this is my identity. This is what my family does, right? And so they were passionate, and God put that passion in them. But it was time to put the passion in its rightful place. You see, in Luke, the first verse I read to you, the miracle introduced them to their maker, in John, the miracle reminded them of their mission. In Luke, Jesus tells Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. In Matthew 4 and 19, it says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. See, there's a permissible will of God and a perfect will of God. And so 
I went to school and I was going to be an art major and I was going to minor in psychology and I had a really, really passionate heart to help people who were hurting and abandoned and abused and with all my heart, I just wanted to help people and I wanted to see them healed and I wanted to see them walking in joy and peace and, and I, that was my plan. And so I was going to move to Florida and I was going to get my master's in art therapy and I had all these plans. And then Jesus called from the shore and he said, hey, why don't you forsake your boats, your plans, your ideas, and why don't you forsake all that and why don't you follow me? And because God put a passion in me to help people and to bring healing to them, that passion was there. It was just misplaced. And in one, I could have gone with the permissible will of God and use the passion God put in me. Or I could forsake all my plans and ideas and follow God and at an altar call lay hands on someone who's broken, hurting. And in one second, through the power of the Holy Ghost, somebody's life be completely radically changed. What would have taken me months, maybe years, and lots of money in a psychologist's office, working with somebody in my own strength, in my own power, and in one instance, the Holy Ghost could flow through me and bring that same power and healing and deliverance. Because it came to a point where God said, I need you to forsake all that, and that passion that I put in you is there, but I need it to be in the right place. And so we need to think about God, whatever it is you're passionate about. There is no doubt in my mind God put that in you. But is it misplaced passion? Is it winning people to the Lord? Is it bringing them healing? Is it bringing them deliverance? Will people be in heaven because of you? Or are you so stuck to your own tradition and prideful ways and this is, what I, this is just what I do and it's who I am and it's my identity and I'm so prideful to stay in this boat that I'm not willing to forsake it all and follow after Jesus. And so in Luke on this particular night, an invitation was given to Peter that allowed his passion to have kingdom purpose. How awesome if the passion in you had kingdom purpose. You know, Sister Becky came to me. She said, I love to cook for people. I love to cook for people, especially when they're going through stuff. I said, Sister Becky, start a C group that when someone in this church has a baby or they're sick, other women with your passion could come together and cook for them and be a blessing to them. My mom loves to sew. So she, there's other women who love to sew. And when we go to Africa, we, we put brand new dresses on over 400 little girls who were in the same dress they had for the past year, shredded. And so their passion for sewing, it wasn't just sewing to sew because they want a new outfit. Now their passion had purpose. And they prayed over every single dress and anointed them with oil. So now that little girl in Africa who doesn't have a mom, whose clothes are shredded, is in a garment that has been sewed together with passion and prayer. So you need to see, God, you put this passion in me. What do you want me to do for it? Because I believe today the same invitation that God gave Peter, the invitation is here today. And he's calling you from the shore saying, hey, why don't you abandon that boat, the boat that you think is your plan for your life, and why don't you forsake that just long enough for you to follow me and forsake it all. And so what if Peter, this uneducated, hot-headed, sinful man, I'm pretty sure he was a Cajun, would have never accepted this invitation? Who would have been crazy enough to get out of the boat and try to walk on water to Jesus? Who would have preached on the day of Pentecost the plan of salvation? Who would have chopped the guy's ear off in the garden? Who would have done this? Who would have preached to the Gentiles? Who would have Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail? Who would have preached in Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10, when the Holy Ghost fell and they all began to speak in tongues and he baptized them all in Jesus' name. 
if Peter would have not answered that invitation that day. So what's the story of your life if you don't answer the invitation that will never be written? How many Cornelius' houses will stay empty, barren, and never experience the power of God and the power of salvation because you don't answer the invitation? But I'm not a Peter. Well, I don't know. When I studied Peter, sounds like many of us. Sinful, hot-headed, foul-mouthed, aggressive, a fisherman, a liar, struggled with his faith, wore shrimp boots. I'm just kidding. (laughs) There's no difference between Peter and you. There's none. It's just a man that was doing his own thing with his own plan, and his ears and his spirit were open, and when Jesus told him to do something, number one, he obeyed. And when he obeyed, a miracle happened. And when the miracle happened, he realized who he was dealing with, and he ran to shore and forsook everything he knew and wanted, his dreams he desired. He forsook it all and followed him. And so God gives us a divine invitation, and we want to think about it, and we want to weigh out the options, and we want to RSVP Jesus at a later date, right? Just in case this whole God thing doesn't work out, let me think about it. Here's the problem. You're not promised tomorrow. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And so we sit here and we think, all right, if we do this God thing, what is my family going to say? And if we go to this church, what's my grandma going to say? And if we, if we pray like this and we worship like this, like what are my friends going to say? And then what if my friends throw this awesome party next weekend, but yet like I'm trying to do this God thing? And so we go back and forth, back and forth. So we're in the boat, and then we're running to the shore. And then next, next week, we're in our boats of our life, and then next weekend, we're running to the shore for Jesus. And so we're back and forth, back and forth. And that's where the spirit of John the Baptist is saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Get ready because I'm coming back. And I'm not coming back for this lukewarm Christian that one day is living for me and one day is not. I want a church, a bride that is sold out, that is sold out. And we don't care what anybody thinks. I am going to live for you. I'm forsaking it all. And I'm following after you, Jesus. And so there's a divine invitation to you today, and like Peter, there are people whose lives are depending on you to accept it. It says in Luke, so when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. When they brought their boats to the land, that was very symbolic, because those boats were their provision. It was their identity. It was their culture. So when they left those boats, It was symbolic of a place of absolute and complete surrender. You want to get filled with the Holy Ghost? You need to drag your boat to Jesus and forsake it all. People say, I can't get filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, there's a boat you haven't left yet. Maybe it's a boat of unbelief. Mm, I don't know if that's for me or that's only for certain people. I was taught that maybe that's just not for everyone. Maybe it's a boat of unforgiveness. Somebody did something to you, so you're holding this unforgiveness. Maybe it's a boat of shame of your past. Maybe it's a boat of rebelliousness or jealousy. Maybe it's a boat of pride. What will that look like, sound like? What will people say? Whatever that boat is, until you drag that boat to this altar and you forsake everything and come to a place of absolute and complete surrender and say, God, I'm just a vessel that I need you to fill and overflow through, and God, I want all of you, and I am at a place of complete and absolute surrender, and I just want to be obedient to your word. The Bible says he gives the Holy Ghost to those who obey. And so 
Here is what the Spirit is saying. It's time to leave your boats, your ideas, your ways. Because it's not working. You're toiling and toiling and toiling. And you're aggravated and you're frustrated. And you have nothing to show for it. But the scripture, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, that only has true meaning when you have toiled all night in your own flesh and you have nothing to show for it. And for some of you, I felt in prayer, there's an urgency. There's, your time is running out. Because God's spirit will only dwell with a man for so long. And so you need to make a decision today. You need to make a decision and say, you know what? I've been doing my own thing. I've been toiling and toiling and my nets are empty and I'm frustrated and aggravated. Maybe I should answer the one who's on shore screaming at me to come after me, to follow me, because I'm ready to make you fishers of men. I'm ready for your passion to have kingdom purpose. I'm ready for you to have something to show for your life and to affect the lives of so many. God wants you to leave this plan B, this boat, because as long as there's a plan B, you're going to go back to it. When things get hard or get disappointed or you start struggling 100% of the time, as long as you have a plan B, you're going to plan B. So there has to come a line in time in the spirit where you cut off that plan B. There is no other option. No matter how hard it is, I am following after you, Jesus. The explorer Cortez, according to legend, Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortez issued a rather interesting order to his men as they began their conquest of the Aztec Empire in 1519. He gave the order, and it was very simple, burn the boats. He wanted his men to realize that they had no opportunity to retreat, so they had to give this fight everything they had. Turning back was not an option. Burning the boats would set an irreversible course for these soldiers. By Cortez giving this command, he was solidifying in his men the mindset of victory as the only option. And I felt God telling me to tell you, there's some boats you need to burn. And you know what they are. For me, God dealt with the boats one by one. Mandy, the music you listen to, as long as you listen to this kind of music, it's going to pull you back away from the things of God. You need to burn that out of your life. Mandy, these clothes you're wearing, you, it's going to bring you back to that old lifestyle of sexual immorality and all this stuff. You need to get rid of these. Mandy, these, this group of people, I love them, but as long as you hang around them and they're, they're influencing you and pulling you away from God, you will never walk into your calling and destiny. You need to burn some of those relationships. Now, if at any point they want to come to you and you can influence them, fine. But as long as they're influencing you, you need to burn those relationships. And step by step, God started showing me like an onion, peeling layer after layer, the boats that I needed to burn. Because as long as they were there, when times got tough and the enemy came, or I got hurt or discouraged, I was going back to those boats as a way out. And God is such a personal God. And he can deal, I can't tell you what the boats are, but I guarantee if I sat with you one by one, you would be able to list the boats in your life that God's saying, burn the boats. Elijah, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah was an amazing prophet. And he was in the field and he put his mantle on Elisha. And the mantle basically was a modern-day spiritual job opportunity of a lifetime. And he puts his mantle on Elijah. And there was a split second that Elijah had to make a decision to follow the prophet or to continue to live the lifestyle he knew. Elijah was a very successful farmer says he had 12 oxen and he was in the field with his plow, plowing when this happened. And so he makes a decision in an instant to join the prophet. 
And because he did that, he got a double portion of blessing, and he did twice as many miracles that Elijah ever did. And once Elisha signed on as Elijah's apprentice, he had to do something. He had to burn the bridges so that when things got tough, he wouldn't be tempted to go back to his old way of life. So he slaughters all his oxen, and he burns his plow. Because as long as those oxen and that plow was there, he could go back to his old ways of comfortable lifestyle provision. But I love what he did. He slaughters the oxen, he burns the plow, and he doesn't do it in secret. He does this big festival. He, he cooks it and gives it to all his friends and family. He threw himself a going-away party, and he invited everyone he knew. He cooked the meat for the oxen, and he gave it to the people. It was his way of saying, this old life is gone forever. That's why baptism is so powerful. You, with full knowledge of what you're doing, not because your mom and dad baptized you, not because your godparents said this is what to do, you, in full knowledge, you're baptized in Jesus' name, an outward expression of an inward decision saying this old lifestyle is dead, buried, gone, and I'm coming up a new creation in Christ. The Bible says Jesus said you must be born again, born of the water and of the Spirit. Old things are passed away. And so baptism, an outward expression to everyone saying I'm done with that old lifestyle. Yeah, it might have been comfortable. Yeah, it might have been fun. Yeah, it might have been our culture but God's calling me a little higher. God's calling me for a double portion, a double blessing, double miracles, a life of reaching people. And so you, you have to make that decision of absolute and complete surrender. And maybe for you, the boats that God's calling you away from, maybe it's boats of your past, your pain, your bitterness, maybe the abuse you went through, maybe your reputation, maybe it's a job, a career, your dreams, your desires. Whatever God is calling you from, he's asking you to just forsake it all and to trust him. Because I promise you, the plan he has for your life is better than anything you could come up with on your own. If you read the book of Ruth, Ruth declares, I'm leaving the gods of my family. I'm leaving that pagan worship. And she turns to Naomi and she says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not going back to that. My God will be your God and your people, my people. And if you go read the book of Ruth, blessings that follow her one decision, you can never outgive God. It says they forsook all and followed him. Nona Freeman, um, my daughter's named after her. Nona, she was a, a great missionary to Africa, her and her husband. God was calling her her whole life, and she was running from it, running from it. And she literally started getting sick and almost died and was dying, falling in the pits of hell, screaming out. Jesus, if you give me one more chance, I'll say yes to the call. I'll say yes to the call. And she kept falling deeper and deeper. And she was calling, God, I'll tell you yes. I'll give you my yes if you give me one more chance. And immediately God brought her back. The doctor said she had been dead for 15 minutes at least. And she woke up and she said, fine, God, I'll answer the call. Because she had her own plans, her own desires. And as soon as her and her husband, Bug, consecrated their lives to the call of Africa, they decided in their hearts, God, we're going to forsake our plans and we're going to answer the call. Her grandmother called and she said, I have a farm of 383 acres. Oil runs through the land. It's literally coming out of the land in three rent houses. You, I'm going to give you all of this plus my wardrobe where I keep all of my money. All you have to do is go to the bank and sign the papers. It's all yours. She said, what's the conditions? She said, oh, that's not hard. You just never have to leave America. She said, I'm sorry, grandmother. 
But God has called me to leave all this and preach Jesus to the continent of Africa. Nona Freeman and her husband preached 70 years on the continent of Africa, building churches all over the continent, leading thousands upon thousands upon thousands to Jesus. The dead were literally raised to life. Miracles, signs, and wonders. But what if she would have never left the boats and forsook it all? What if she would have made some type of cognition and allowed that all those promises from the grandmother just to stay there just in case times got hard? Because she lost a child. She had malaria. She, she almost died several times. Things got so hard. But she kept pursuing. But I'm telling you, if she would have had that there as plan B, it would have been real tempting to go back. But she blur burned the plow with her grandmother and said, I'm sorry, that's not an option. You see, this is what happens when God-given passion locks eyes with your calling and obedience locks hands with faith. But when the Spirit of God speaks and you obey, I promise you, your nets can't hold the blessings and provisions and the souls coming in with the truth that you have. It is in that miracle of your once empty nets now full that you will fall on your face like Peter and realize that the God that commands the fish into the nets invites you to follow him and make you fishers of men. In John 21, it brings us to a place where Jesus has died. And we find Peter walking on the shore, and he says, I'm going fishing. And we don't know what condition Peter's in. Like, I just gave everything for three years, and now Jesus is gone. I just left everything I knew, and now Jesus is gone. We know that Jesus had denied him three times, so was he walking just full of shame and discouragement? Or I can't answer this call to be a fisher of men without Jesus here by my side. We don't know what was going through Peter's mind. We don't know if he was mad or angry, if he felt deserted by Jesus. But what we do know, he went back to what was familiar. Isn't that what we do? We start trying to live for God. Things get a little shaky and rough. People get upset with us, whatever. And then we find ourselves going back to what's familiar. And I know right now, if I decided to stop living for God, where you could find Mandy Holloway, and it would not be church, right? Because we go back to what's familiar. Proverbs 26, 11 says it's like a dog returning to their vomit. Ironically, they're on the same sea, the same men, the same darkness of night, the same toiling, the same struggle, the same outcome, nothing. Empty boat empty nets, and their emptiness that this world offers because there is nothing this world can offer you that will fulfill you. Everything the world can offer you is a cheap imitation of the real thing. And so here in their emptiness, it's interrupted once again by that same familiar voice, the master calling them saying, hey, how's that emptiness working for you? And so this time he calls them children, right? Because there's a two-year-old toddler in all of us that even though our parents, Jesus, has told us what to do and what not to do, when he's not around, what do we do? Go back to our old ways. You know, I had a kid that used to lick everything. It's pretty gross. She would lick the sides of tables at restaurants with people. It was so embarrassing. She would walk up to that pole, lick the pole, lick a tire. It's horrible. It's gross. Spank her, correct her, turn around. She's licking maybe the speaker, the cord. You know, we're in Disney and the railing, the three-hour wait. Yeah. Spank her, whip her. We weren't around. There she is. I won't give names. I'm sure if you know my family, you know which one it is. And so, you know, we have this man of God at our house one day. You know, 
I'm giving everybody the smile, evil eye, like you better act right, you know. And at our house, here's the disclaimer. We do love Jesus, me and my husband. That's it. We do. And we are trying. But that original sin in these little kids are like, it's like nothing you've ever seen in your life. So we got to beat it out of them. And until then, please have mercy and grace. And so she proceeds to lick the bottom of the pastor's shoe. <laughs> right? So there's nothing you can say, no scripture. You can't make that biblical, spiritual, nothing, you know. And we, have, we had spanked her and, come, you know, all this stuff. And I had, to con I had to keep correcting her, correcting her, because I know what's best for her. Boo, you're never going to be the homecoming queen if you keep licking things, okay? I'm just trying to look out for your future, you know? You're probably not going to get married if you like licking stuff, you know? So, but that's what we do as a parent. That's what God does with us. We got these weird, ridiculous things and quirks in us, and he keeps, you know, disciplining us, correcting us, because he knows for our future, this is not going to be good for you. And when he's not around, what do we do? We go back to those things. And so here, we see where God is on the shore, and he's saying, oh, God, Peter, what are you doing? Come back. Come back. So the second time around, He's reminding him of his mission, saying, Peter, I never called you to this. I called you to be a fisher of men. I've called you to be a fisher of men. So that same familiar voice. See, the first and the second time, obedience drew miracles of great magnitude. But this time, the nets did not break. The first time Peter saw the sinful man that he was and he told Jesus to depart from him. The second time Peter recognized this loving, merciful God who gives us a second and third chance and he comes running to him. The first time Jesus calls him to a higher duty to forsake all and the second time Jesus reminds him of his mission. Both times Jesus knows the toil and the struggle and the disappointment. But in both cases, Peter realizes, I can't do this without you. We can't do this without Jesus. We're going to end up just toiling, miserable, empty. Total dependence and surrender. That's what Jesus is after. So you need to ask, are your nets empty for a reason? Have you been trying to do it on your own, in your own strength? And so there Jesus is sitting with provision and fire. And I believe the fire represented the fire that was about to fall on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell. And I believe that fish was on the fire saying, Jesus, telling, Jesus telling them, hey, I'm going to be your provision. And Jesus met them at the very same place that dawn that he met them when he first called them. Because you see, your giftings and callings are without repentance. And so you are called then and you're called now. And no matter what you've done, the call is still there. It looks different for all of us. Jesus called them from the shore, and that's very prophetic because there's going to be a day where Jesus is going to call you to the other shore. Are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to go with him with your net so full of the miracles and people that you reached? And see, the second time those nets didn't break. You know why? When you're doing it for God, every soul to him matters, and he won't let one slip through the cracks. So I want to meet Jesus on that shore, dragging a big old net of souls that I taught Bible studies to, that I loved on, that I spoke to, that I cooked for, that I reached for him. What was so unique was in that time, there were, there were ten rules. And one was if you weren't one of the Israelites, you could only use a single hook and you couldn't use a net or a ship. You couldn't use a boat. But if you were the children of Israel, you were allowed on that sea to put your boat out and to use a net. And so as children of God, you have the right and authority to cast your nets out in faith with the passion God has given you to reach as many of the lost as you can. And you cannot think with a single hook mentality. 
You can't think with a single hook mentality. It's not okay that just your son's living for God. You, that's a single hook mentality. You got to cash your spiritual nets. My whole household is going to be saved. You can't pray with a single hook mentality. Oh, it's good that just my office manager is coming to church and living for God. You have to cast your spiritual nets. I'm not satisfied till my whole office is living for God. You can't pray single hook prayers anymore. The time is short and God's coming back for his people. And he wants you to think with spiritual nets. He says, as children of God. Holy Ghost feel you have the right and authority to cast your spiritual nets in prayer. I want my whole city to be saved. I'm not okay that it is the cool thing to do that everybody gets trash and drunk on Friday nights and strolls in on Saturdays and strolls into church Sunday hungover, pop a little communion, go out before church is even over. That is not okay. That is a single hook mentality. At least they're going to church. No, they're going through vain, repetitious, cultural lifestyle that has no meaning. And when God comes back, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a single hook mentality. But as children of God, Holy Ghost filled, we have the right and authority to cast spiritual nets and say, God, I want the city of Thibodeau to be a place of revival. I want House of Prayer to be a city set on a hill that people can run to and find safety and salvation. We can't think and pray with single hook mentalities. I'm not okay unless everyone I know can feel the love of God consuming them. So I can offer a Bible study and sit down and pray with people. I'm like, God, make me John the Baptist. I will baptize every person in Jesus' name that I ever meet. My mama's pool, I think we're in the almost 30s of people we have baptized in her pool. And I'm not satisfied with that. That's a single hook mentality. I want it to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I really want it to be the Spanish people. You know why? They throw it down like Elijah. They have cake and, and burritos and nachos and they have music. I'm like, they do it like Elijah. God sent me, sent me the Spanish people. But today as we all stand, I want you to just close your eyes and say, God, What are the boats that I need to forsake and follow you? What are the plows I need to burn because I'm holding on to them as a backup plan if this whole God thing doesn't work out? God, have I forgotten my mission? Maybe you were prophesied over, maybe you were prayed over, maybe God gave you a dream or a vision and you have gone back and you've forgotten that call or that purpose. Maybe God's been dealing with you and calling you and you don't understand it, but you just, you're pursuing God and you're hungry and God's putting people in your life like never before, loving on you and giving you scriptures and encouraging you. And God is calling you out of the boat of your culture, calling you out of the boat of your family and saying, hey, I have more for you. I want more for you. God's saying, forsake it all. You might not understand it, but I just need you to be obedient. 